Good morning. It is Tuesday, August 24th, and this is the Story County Board of Supervisors meeting in which I'd like to call to order. Please stand if you are able and join us in stating the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, there will be one change to today's agenda um, under additional items. Number one, the discussion and consideration for the Ames Aquatic Center um, is going to be moved to a later date for discussion. Um, with that, is there a motion to approve today's today's amended agenda? So moved. Then moved. I'll second. Basil? Aye. Evans? Aye. It is approved. Next up is for public comment number one. This is the comment period for the public to address topics on today's agenda. If anyone would like to make public comment, they can please come forward. Or if you're on Zoom, hit the raise hand function. Not seeing anyone at this particular time. Dan, if you'd like to. Yeah, just. Sure, you have to come on up so maybe Owl can. Okay, good, good you. morning. I'm Dan Colhane with the Ames Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development Commission. Um, I'm pleased to introduce, well, maybe you didn't find the polling. Steel Harder is our, our new Director of Community and Economic Development Outreach. He'll be leading our contractual obligation with you as a Board of Supervisors. Steel comes highly recommended to our organization. He had an internship with the City of Urbandale, an Economic Development, urban, uh, uh, economic development uh, Internship. Uh, Story City, uh, City Minister Mark Jackson had reached out indicating uh, he had keen new steel as well. So. Uh, it's his second day on the job. He beat me at the office both days. He was in before seven yesterday and again this morning. Uh, I think you'll like him. He's, he's a delightful young man, graduate of Iowa State University, and will be routinely uh, attending your board meetings and connecting with you as elected officials on the work he's doing on, on our behalf, but ultimately on behalf of you as a board of supervisors. And so, again, I wanted to introduce him this morning and I'm sure he's got a good reason, and maybe he got stuck with the detour. But uh, I look forward to you meeting him, and thank you for your ongoing support. Sure, thank sure. You. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, you're still here, Dan, and he comes in, just kind of wave us when he's well, coming thank in. Thank you. So, great. Thank you. Anyone else at this particular time? Seeing that, we'll close the public comment time, and we'll move on to the presentation from the City of Maxwell, the 2021 Urban Renewal Area Project. Program application. And starting out with Leanne. Good morning. Good morning, Leanne. Um, I just want to take a brief couple minutes. Um, just, I did share a schedule that we're following for this fall's um, fiscal year 23 urban renewal area program. Um, today kicks off the presentations by the applicants. Um, we did receive, Story County did receive three applications for funding from the city of Maxwell, the city of Collins, and the city of Roland. So this morning is um, Maxwell's opportunity to share the application with the board and ask um, the board to ask any questions for further clarifications. Um, then the next meeting, two meetings will be Collins and Roland, but then on September 7th is a consultation meeting too at 9 a.m. So that is when all the affected taxi entities are able to attend and have a discussion with the board as well. Um, but I do have the schedule available, and um, in the next two weeks, this will be going online as well as the draft plan. So I want to at least kick this off so you understand the process and then invite Steve Gast and Doug Miller. Are there any questions for me? No, I appreciate the, that you've laid this out. Uh, I like the color coding too. It's a lot yeah. easier to follow. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Supervisor Edmonds and uh, Faith Faisal. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. We are here to answer questions, but before we answer questions, uh, I'm sure you've read through the application, but I'll just briefly go through it, uh, hit, hit some of the highlights. Uh, we've been working with the county and the property owner on this property for a little over or almost five years now trying to 
get to a point where the property could be developed. Uh, we've used the county's uh, assistance in uh, professional staff in helping organize in training the council uh, doing a number of activities uh, learning how to develop. Uh, we've worked with the landowner uh, who has these great ideas of developing but the landowner is not a developer. He is uh, just a property owner uh, and he's worked with realtors, he's worked with uh, various other people and we have finally gotten to a point where there is a developer from the Ankeny area who's willing to come up and try a development in Maxwell. The problem has always been we do not have an established market for developable property. Uh, we, if a house is on for sale uh, in Maxwell, it usually sells uh, within the week, but those are existing houses and not new houses. And so developers are a little bit shy about coming up and investing a few million dollars, uh, not knowing whether there will be a return on their investment. Uh, the developer that we currently are talking with is ATI out of Ankeny. Uh, it is a firm which has lots of experience uh, in residential development. And at the time we submitted this proposal, uh, there was a plan to do 26 uh, or 28 lots uh, in uh, the about a little bit less than 12 acres of land uh, in two phases. Since then, as the developer has been developing uh, uh, preliminary and final plans, uh, sewer line uh, connections and everything else, uh, it has become obvious that uh, it's going to have to be all done in one phase uh, rather than two phases uh, because he needs the dirt from one side uh, to be moved uh, which would have been in phase two to be moved into the side which was going to be phase one in order to help with uh, uh, having an adequate uh, fall in the sewer lines. Uh, so they are now looking at doing all of this in a single phase. Whether it's going to be exactly 28 lots, whether it's going to be uh, 26 lots uh, is a function of the final design, uh, but the the plan still stays stays the same. The city is being asked uh, to participate in the cost of the public improvements. Public improvements would be about uh, 1.4 million dollars, and we're being asked to contribute to about half that cost, which reduces the developer's risk and also reduces the cost of the individual lots that will be sold. Lots, the developers are willing to contract that the lots would be uh, sold at $50,000 a piece rather than the uh, $75,000 that would be required uh, if they had to uh, do the whole cost themselves. The, uh, what does not change in this is that we would uh, be asking the county to assist us in the city share of the cost. If we pick up the entire cost ourselves, which we will do if the county does not participate, uh, then uh, we would be at 95% of our bonding capacity. Uh, we would establish a TIF district. Uh, much of uh, the cost uh, for the 
this would be paid for for about of the uh, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, a little bit less than half of it would be paid by TIF revenue, and the other half uh, would be paid out of the uh, uh, general obligation bond that we would have to issue in order to fund uh, our share of the cost. We feel that this is worth uh, the effort and we'll proceed with this, uh, but it will put us at the edge of our bonding capacity, which is why we are asking for assistance. It fits within the county's uh, guidelines and that it is transportation and in transportation infrastructure and uh, housing development. Uh, and I know it's an unusual request. Uh, if funded through the county, what we don't know yet is whether or not uh, the county would be doing the TIF district uh, in Maxwell, whether it be a joint TIF district. I've talked to the bond council uh, and they have no concern either way. They'd say they'd be willing to work with the county on whatever uh, makes sense and is legal. Uh, and uh, we are not experts in development, so we would certainly be willing to take lead from the county uh, in the most appropriate way of doing this. With that, uh, I'll certainly entertain any questions you may have. Uh, myself or uh, Doug, we're both council people. Uh, we may not be able to answer everything, but uh, we'll certainly be able to take notes and get back to you. Appreciate your presentation. Um, I don't know, Supervisor Dave, you want to start off? I've got some questions that you want me to go ahead. Go ahead. So um, I'm just looking because there's two phases, and I just have the number right in front of me. The cost in there was it like three hundred thousand one year and four hundred thousand the next, if I'm mm -hmm. if I'm correct. Um, that's what I thought. So you said the total was um, was about 1.4 million, and you're asking for the county for assistance. So are you asking the county for that 700,000 or half of that that particular portion? It's unclear based on your application and what you say, what, what you said. So that's why I'm seeking clarification. We're asking the county to participate at the $700,000 level, which would eliminate our need to do a geo bond. Uh, which if we do it takes us to the 95 percent of our geo bond capacity right we only have uh, a little left because we've spent a lot of money on our uh so we do so each treatment plan just like every other small town is doing nowadays right right no i appreciate that that's what i thought but just how you stated i want to make sure i was clear on that um and then with these development, um, and I'm trying to go back to kind of the housing study um, as well that was done. So are you looking at these being more low, moderate? What type of price range do you know that these are looking to be in? These will be in the range of $250,000, so it will not be low and moderate income housing. Uh, what we anticipate happening and what has happened in the past uh, when the uh, last development we had is that uh, people who are currently uh, occupying larger older homes in Maxwell uh, may, may move out there, which will open up other houses, which will make some low and moderate income housing available. We know that uh, if we do a TIF district, we have a, require, a low and moderate income requirement where we would have to set aside money uh, and the council has talked about uh, using some of that set aside money as uh, a way to reduce the sewer and water bills for low and moderate income individuals within the within the town of Maxwell uh, and other housing related uh, uh, projects as required. And it looks by the map 
the, the housing district is, is within your city limits. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, then I did a question I you said so the developer that you have coming in would assume sounds like they're gonna assume more of the risk. So are you looking I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out so are they gonna be the ones that are kinda of upfronting the funds? I yes. know wanting stuff from the county or, or city or whatever, but then being paid as the lots are being sold. They uh they would uh be paid uh, upon completion of the public improvements. They have an obligation uh, in the, would have an obligation in the contract uh, to complete uh, uh, 10 houses in eight years. Uh, and if they fail to complete 10 houses in eight years, they would uh, be required to uh, pay back uh, $20,000 per house. So there is uh, a little bit of incentive for them to uh, uh, move the property uh, once it's developed. I, I don't think that is a major incentive. I think that once they spend as uh, the million plus dollars uh, and have lots for sale, they're going to be interested in moving those lots as quickly as possible. They are developers and they're in the business of moving property. Sure. And then I guess just based on your comment there, so eight houses in 10 years, uh, but the total of potentially 28. I think it was 10 houses in eight years. Or 10 houses in eight years, sorry. Um, you're right. That's how I did write that down correctly. <laughs> Um, you did mention the total would be what 26 or potentially 28 houses. Yes. Am I correct there? So where does that fit in? If you've got 10 houses in eight years, is is what's the plan then? That well, the the, uh, the hope is that all 28 houses would be developed within that uh, 10 years. Gotcha. Looking at a minimum of, of ten of of, of, of the ten. ten. Gotcha. And if they okay. don't complete the ten, then they owe us twenty thousand for each one, short of that fact. But as Steve referenced, I think they're, they're in the business of moving houses. Sure. They're gonna get people in and the domino theory then will impact our low and moderate income. Right. Okay, okay. So they need to do at least ten houses minimum. with yes. the goal of twenty eight to not get the penalization of the twenty thousand. Right. For, for household then. Okay, okay. And we, we've all seen that there are external factors uh, such as uh, COVID that creates uh, a delay in delivery or increased costs and uh, all kinds of things uh, that can happen in the development game that slows things down. Uh, but, uh, which is why we didn't look for anything more than a guarantee of 10 houses in eight years. And that also allowed us to do some projections with our financial consultant to see uh, what the impact on the city budget would be uh, because the revenue that's generated by the TIF district would not uh, pay the total debt each year. We would still be uh, trying to come up, we would still come up with uh, uh, up to $30,000 in some year, but mostly 10 to $15,000 out of our regular budget in order to satisfy the debt. And your funding request that you have here is based on uh, with the hopes of building 28 homes. Is yes. that correct? Okay. That's my question for right now. Do you, do you expect any negative impact, um, though, of having to change it from two phases into one phase? No, as a matter of fact, it's 
simplifying things a little bit because in two phases, we would have had a short cul-de-sac that would, would have been built uh, and then connecting. Uh, there would have been a dead end water line and uh, the problems of having a, a cul-de-sac with no guarantee that the next phase would be coming in uh, was a little worrying, at least to me, by turning it into a single phase. Yes, we now have all the money due at once, but we also then have a circulation path for the roads. Uh, the water lines, the sewer line uh, work out a little bit better. Uh, works out better for the developer because of moving the dirt. Uh, so it, it seemed to simplify things uh, and create a guarantee that the entire development will get done. I guess one of the questions I have is what is your time frame potentially? Well, we will probably uh, start uh, construction. Uh, the developer will probably start construction this next spring. We will go into a contract with the developer um, late fall, early winter. Uh, if we have to set up a TIF district ourselves and do the bonds and all that stuff, uh, that would be done uh, again in the spring uh, so that when the bill comes due, the cash will be there sometime in early summer. What we want to do is have uh, two or three houses uh, constructed uh, before Old Settlers next year because Old Settlers brings in a couple thousand people in the community and being able to see uh, the, the houses, uh, see the road and everything else uh, uh, I think would be uh, good for the community uh, and then we're off and running. Thanks. Any additional questions at this time? Um, well, just what, where, where are you at with the water and sewer? Um, upgrade or, or project is it are you done with that for our sewage plant uh had to have uh had to be upgraded to meet the uh discharge uh higher discharge uh, limits or the lower discharge we were talking about. <laughs> uh, and we will be done with that project uh in september it'll be uh well right now it's being held up because one of the things that uh, was required was a cover for the lagoon. And uh, the cover uh, is on back order, like many things uh, due to COVID. Uh, but as soon as that comes in, then the project could be done. It may be October rather than September. Uh, uh, and the DNR has approved the delay. Uh, the capacity is there in the plan uh, to handle 50-ish uh, more houses. So uh, uh, with our current uh, uh, infiltration, uh, so we could do some things to expand that in the future, but it's enough to handle this development. Great, great. I think, so. I think other questions I have, I know Supervisor Merkin was unable to be here today and she may have some questions uh, since she'll do, uh, listen to the, the meeting, the recording of the meeting and may reach out to her questions. Well, well. And if we move forward together, we are flexible uh, in uh, doing this over uh, as proposed uh, two years, uh, doing it over more than two years, uh, uh, whatever works out for the board. Because uh, uh, doing it together is going to be much easier for the city than doing it alone. If it, if it 
took longer, just, just so I understand how things work, would you still have to um, pick your yourselves up to that 95%? Would you still have to well, do that it, route? That, that would depend upon um, how, what the county's contribution would look like. Uh, if we have to pay the contractor uh, the $700,000 by summer and uh, would mean that we would uh, go either do an obligation bond or use other cash reserves as a short-term loan. Uh, and if we uh, did uh, an obligation bond or other financing that could be paid off on shorter terms mm -hmm. than a geo bond, then yeah, we could avoid going up to 95%, uh, even stretching it out over more than two years. But yeah, that's something that I would want to have bond counsel and our financial advisor uh, sure. really helping us with. Sure, yeah, I just wasn't sure what that would, what that would look like. Yeah, I, so. it seems to me to be a uh, possibility. We would just be doing uh, shorter term debts uh, yeah. while if the county spread their payments out over longer periods of time. But that's still better than doing it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for sharing your thoughts and as I said, we may have some additional questions that we'll follow up with you with, and Supervisor Morgan may have some um, as well, but she's unavoidably not able to be here today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <clears throat> Next, we will move on. We have consideration of a proclamation recognizing August 30, 31st as International Over, Overdose Awareness Day. Um, Supervisor Faisal, would you like to join me in reading this? Uh, whereas International Overdose Awareness Day is recognized globally on August 31st to raise awareness about the risk of overdosing, honor the special someone whose lives have been lost from overdosing and acknowledge the grief felt by families, friends, and communities around the world. And whereas Overdose Awareness Day aims to publicly challenge the stigma associated with substance use disorders and overdosing. And whereas recent reports show that in 2020, over 92,000 lives were lost in the United States due to overdose, the most ever in a single year, and up to 30% and up 30% from the 71,000 lives lost in 2019. The rise in overdose deaths in Iowa and our six bordering states are similar with 8,447 lives lost last year up from 4,920 lives five years earlier. And whereas every person's life is valuable and every overdose death is preventable, it is imperative to recognize overdose as a social issue with, which impacts victims, their families, friends, and communities. And whereas Story County is calling on all communities, the state and the country to support overdose prevention policies and projects and end the stigma and silence surrounding substance abuse and overdose. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Story County Board of Supervisors, do hereby proclaim August 31st, 2021, International Overdose Awareness Day. Thank you. Is there a motion? Um, uh, I will approve of proclamation. Second. Basil? Aye. Adams? Aye. I know the challenge is that overdose uh, does on a number of individuals, not just themselves, but their families, um, the impact um, and seeing from my work in the legislature and seeing what we could do at the county level, city level, and actually national level, um, whatever we can do to provide support programs, um, because you need to treat the whole family, mm -hmm. not just the individual. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's important to recognize that um, the, the, these are people 
these are people with families. These are people who are daughters and sons and friends and brothers and sisters. Um, so I think it's important to remember that human piece and that it impacts everyone, um, no matter where you're from or who you are, or how much money you make. There is a, there's an event this Saturday, um, an overdose awareness event this Saturday at 10 o'clock at Ada Hayden. Um, just recognizing um, those who have been lost and supporting their families. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. okay, next, we will move on to agency reports. We have primary health care's annual report. I'm not sure if Kelly is on or if someone from primary health care is on. Uh, yes, I see it was at Nathan. Good morning, Nathan. I, there, you should be on. Good morning. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So we do have the primary health care um, annual report, but if you'd like to highlight some areas. Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, um, just want to thank you again for the, the funds that were contributed um, and helping to make the Story County Dental Clinic a success um, through primary health care. Um, as you'll see from the agency report, uh, we had 471 patients that we saw um, for unique visits uh, between March 15th and July 31st. And of those 471 individual patients that we, that we served, um, almost all of them were uninsured or um, on some form of, of public option insurance, so Medicare, Medicaid, or Hawkeye. Um, in addition, we served five veterans during that time. Um, and overall, we saw 1,030 uh, appointments in the last, um, in that four month period. And, and was this for dental only? No. This, correct. This is, is only dental visits. No. How, how far out are you um, taking a, making appointments? Is there a backlog? Uh, there is. Um, typically, we only open up our schedule uh, a few weeks at a time. Um, I believe Haley may be on the call as well. She's actually the clinic administrator for the Ames Dental Clinic. Um, but typically, we in our dental clinics, we only open up our schedule a few weeks at a time to mitigate uh, patient no-shows. And so... Uh, there is definitely a, a, a waiting list for patients to get into the clinic. And I, because I've been out there, you've got a great um, setup for your dental clinic. So um, how often is your dental clinic, clinic open every day? I just, I don't recall. That's correct. Our dental clinic is open every day from 8, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's the, the same hours as our medical clinic. Um, and if I recall too, when we were out there visiting, I know you were trying to look at, I think if you had patients in your medical clinic of being that kind of that holistic of looking what else they need, you know, do they need dental care and things. So what would be kind of the time frame are you looking at if someone was seen in the medical clinic to then get them into the dental clinic? Is that really quick or is that still might be a couple weeks, a couple weeks out? Haley, is, is that a question that you can answer? Yeah, um, to speak back to the first question though about scheduling, um, all clinic administrators across PHC kind of agreed to open up the schedule farther than um, about the three weeks. So we are pretty booked out for new appointments. However, within PHC, that is the highest no-show rate of appointments. Um, so we do kind of keep track of that in a way so that way we can fill those appointments back up if somebody doesn't show. Um, with the integration of 
seeing medical and dental patients. Um, typically, I would say within a month, they can get in, especially because if we have a patient that does not show up for their establishing appointment, um, we're keeping track of those medical patients that now want to be seen in the dental clinic. Um, so that way we can give them a call as well to get them in in an adequate time. Um, another part of that integration piece where we will be focusing on um, the integration of our OB services in dental um, to make sure that expecting mothers can get in within that same day, same week, um, or at least in the appropriate time that's recommended within their pregnancy to get a dental check as well if they don't have a dental provider. So then are, are you able to, to um, take like emergency cases then as Yes, we have um, typically four limited same day appointments available within our schedule. Um, however, if anybody's ever in extreme amount of pain, um, it's a child or um, an expecting mother, we kind of have the rule of thumb that will work them in no matter what. Um, if some, if those, all four of those appointments fill up at 8 a.m., if someone's adamant about getting in, we can also have them sit and wait um, in case if there's another cancellation to get them in, because typically those same day appointments are limited appointments when people are in pain, um, don't necessarily take very long just because treatment typically ends up being um, like a tooth extraction, antibiotic, a referral somewhere else. So it, it's a pretty quick process. I don't, I, I'm just, I'm glad that you're able to provide these services. I, I know they're um, incredibly important and healthcare and dental healthcare are one of the same things. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that you're able to provide those services there. Yeah, Marissa had asked me to share a success story. So I guess just another thank you to you guys. Um, because of our dental clinic, one patient to highlight that I actually worked with last week, um, he has not been seen by a medical or dental provider within about three to four years. He came in to see um, Dr. Postler. He wasn't on our waiting list very long. Um, she had discovered kind of textbook to the T of mouth cancer. Um, so that was caught early and we're working with him on transportation and referrals. Um, he doesn't really have, he does have a little bit of a learning disability. So we've taken the time to kind of educate him. This is the process of what it's gonna be, um, making sure he knows when he's coming back in for the rest of his treatment after he gets treated for the cancer that was discovered. So it has been a great help to our community. Great, great, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. All right, moving on. Uh, minutes, consideration of minutes. Uh, I'll second, April, five, seven, five. <laughs> kind of off with this two of us yeah. here. Uh, next is consideration of personnel action. We will consider the personnel action. Second, Basil, five, seven, five. Uh, consent agenda. Are you going to be pulling any consent, consent agenda? Okay, I am not either. Second. Basil? Aye. Pettin? Aye. Consent agenda. Uh, now we are down to the public hearing. First consideration of ordinance number 295, amending chapter 32, road identification address numbering system, Story County Code of Ordinance. Good morning, Amelia and Marco. Good morning. I have a presentation of it. So you saw this a few weeks ago and we since we published and made some changes. Um, so I'll just be talking about those changes uh, and this would be your first consideration again. So uh, our recommendation would be approval on first consideration and then Marcus can have second consideration next week and Marcus can update you next week on if there's any new comments and then typically you can wait for a consideration after that. Um, 
So, okay, the changes we made since the last hearing when it was remanded back to staff. Um, we added in design requirements for subdivision street name signs, so just making sure those could be uniform look. Um, we also clarified that only cities after an annexation can request a road name change without petition from property owners. Next slide. We did clarify that address markers cannot be moved without prior approval of the 911 board in that section that allows a property owner to go to the 911 board to request it. And then finally, we added in the language about we'll have voting precinct information when we send out letters of notification um, about annexations, and we ran that by reason. So those are all the changes since last time. Any questions we can answer? No, no, I don't say anything. Yeah, I appreciate you listening to what we, our, our suggestions and, and uh, taking it back and doing some revisions. Yeah, it was, it was helpful. I'm happy with that. And not up to it, yeah. Oh, there's a public view. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So now I will open the public hearing for ordinance number 295. And if there is anyone who'd like to make comments, if you're on Zoom, please use the raise hand function so that we can make sure we unmute you. Or if you're in the public meeting room, you can come on forward. I'll just wait a few seconds to star nine for Zoom to unmute. All right, so I'm not seeing anyone. Of course, we'll close the public hearing. Now, any further discussion? I would move approval of ordinance 295 amending chapter 32 road identification address numbering system. I'm sorry, 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 Evan Delval, I'm a civil engineer with ISG, uh, and here to talk about county inspections for those two pipelines. Um, really hoping that this is more of a, of a dialogue that I can answer questions that you guys have, but I, I appreciate your time and finding it to be coming here and talk. I'll give you a little bit of an overview as to what the projects are, as much as I know about them, a little bit about what the county inspection is, and like I said, any questions you guys have, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, so, to date, there are two proposed carbon dioxide pipelines through Story County. One is the Midwest County or Midwest Carbon Express that is being done by Summit Carbon Solutions. And the other is the Heartland System line that's being done uh, by Navigator CO2. I don't have any information on the location or the size of those lines, but liquefied carbon dioxide is considered a hazardous liquid state of Iowa and as such it is open to the uh, 479b and chapter 9 requirements um, which puts a uh, a responsibility on on your board to provide county inspection for certain construction activities of those lines through agricultural areas we did similar work for this county on the Dakota access pipeline that came through uh, a few years ago so as information about this came available, I contacted Lucy Martin and Darren Moon about doing the same work for you guys now. Uh, I understand this board has changed over since that. So uh, again, any questions you have about the process and, and what your responsibilities are and what our inspection approach is, uh, happy to answer those right now. Um, I guess my one question, I appreciate you taking that time and being here today, is just the timing. I, I know that there is a public meeting or um, 
it was September 13th. Ah, 16th, I think, in Story County. Could be, could be, but that's my mind of the gender range for me. So, um, uh, um, I, I'm just assuming that once that we have that particular meeting, we learn more as to the extent there, and we do learn more than what your involvement might be, or potentially maybe. Yes, I mean, I, I would hope that we get more information on some of the particulars with the actual pipeline itself. So construction is said to be, from what I'm told, 18 to 24 months out. Uh, and it's important to remember that I, I don't, I have no affiliation with the pipeline. Um, they're, they're designing all of that's being done uh, independent of anything that I'm here to talk about. Um, but yeah, I hope that that public meeting provides some more context to the project itself. Um, going back to Dakota Access for a second, one of the lessons learned from that particular project is that the whole state was kind of playing catch up with the pipeline, trying to figure out what the rules are, what the requirements are, what the responsibilities for the county is. Um, and because there was a lot of uncertainty around that, most counties, I, I actually say all counties, kind of held off on making any decisions about what they were gonna do until they absolutely had to. And what that did is it put landowners and county inspection at kind of a, a behind the eight ball, so to speak. Um, we we're trying to we we're trying to play catch up and get out there, get get our staffing up to speed, get an understanding of the, the project impacts, um, coordinate with landowners the best that we can. So looking at this project, having you know a year and a half to two years before construction starts, uh, my recommendation to counties is to take advantage of that time, get your county inspection staff in place, uh, give them an opportunity to meet with counties meet with your landowners, um, try to coordinate as much information as possible between the landowner and the pipeline so that there are less unknowns when you get into that. Um, to date, the only thing that's set is that September public meeting. Um, I think there's value in having a county inspection representative there for the county. Um, I don't know if you're planning on attending that meeting, but if you are, if a landowner stands up and asks you what you're doing to help it. I think I think it, there's value in saying we knew about the project. We're proactive. This is the this is the firm we've hired to do that work. They're here. Um, we we'd encourage you to coordinate with them, communicate with them any concerns that you have, and that really kicks it off for us. So could you explain to me a little bit if we would move forward with the contracting? Mm -hmm. Kind of what, as you said, they're not going to or doesn't look like they'll be doing anything for 18 to 24 months. Yeah. So explain a little bit more detail your role in that meantime. In that Again, interim? That's, that's an if, if we move forward. Yeah. So first of all, what we're looking at at this point is a letter of intent only. So and we're looking for that in order to help us with staffing projections. So as we as we get ready for this project, there are 32 counties impacted by this project. If you reference back to code access, there were 18. So it's a significantly larger geography that this is impacting. Um, so staffing, staffing starts really now getting getting in contact with inspectors, getting this on their radar and trying to make sure that we're coordinated from the scheduling on, on having adequate staff for that. So that's part of what we would be doing in this interim. More importantly, though, it is starting to open up lines of communication with landowners to help under, help us understand what they have in their in their parcels uh, whether that's underground drain tile conservation efforts that they've done out there um, considerations for future improvements all of that information can be communicated to us which ultimately gets communicated to the pipeline it just helps like i said mitigate the unknowns it helps the pipeline as they're doing their design designed for the ultimate condition as opposed to going in blind and needing to make adjustments on the fly. Um, again, it's just it's just taking advantage of all the time that we have at this point. So you, you also sort of were alluding to what we would be doing from a from a cost standpoint for this as well. Iowa code puts 100 percent of the county inspection fee responsibility onto the pipeline. So ISD would, if you were to hire us, would would invoice our work to Story County. Story County would then send that invoice off to the pipeline. Once the pipeline pays Story County, you would pay ISP. So you function as a, as a pass-through uh, agent in this. 
Um, I can assure you that at no point will the county be responsible for a penny of this work. Anything that is done outside of the mandated inspection, ISG would be doing at risk. So that would be on us to coordinate that with the pipeline, make sure that they understand what we're doing. Um, they would be responsible for paying that. So there's the communication, the coordination, that's, that's on ISG. We would be communicating that with you as to what we've agreed to. Um, but that again is, is work that's being done here before before the inspection takes off. So if for some reason there were several meetings and then there was a decision not to move forward by the companies putting the pipeline, they would be on the hook for your time. Either they would be on the hook or we would just eat that cost. Um, and so that's spelled out in that letter of intent at the bottom there of just saying, if this project doesn't go forward for any, any reason, it, it just goes away. There's there's no obligation on the county to do anything. And so, would, would your company be inspecting the pipeline that as the pipelines are being put in, also not just as front work working with landowners, but as the work is being done? Yeah, that, that's, that's what the code requires. So, okay. everything we've talked about now is again sort of the lessons learned from Dakota Access on where we can find added value to the inspection work that I've had those conversations with the pipeline already. Like I said, there's, there's that's work being done at risk by us, but we think that we can show the value in that to the pipeline. All of the inspection work, that's what's spelled out by code. So chapter 479B and chapter nine of the Iowa code says that for certain construction activities, you have to have a county inspector there. Um, and that's starting with right away staking, moving into topsoil stripping, uh, clearing and grubbing, trenching, impacts to drain tile, both, both the cutting and the temporary and permanent repair of those, backfilling that trench, uh, ripping the subsoils, uh, relaying the topsoil, getting that back to the proper contour and depth for the original uh, site, and then restoration of that, of that area to whatever the code requires in that. Um, all of that requires inspection. So ISG comes at this a little bit unique um, from, from other potential firms in the state is that it, these projects don't happen on a regular basis. No firm in Iowa is making their living on inspecting pipelines. They're just they're too few and far between. Um, so ISG, as we look at that, these are pipeline projects. They're not drainage projects. They happen to be done in agricultural areas. They happen to be impacting some drain tile, but they're not drain tile projects. They're, they're, there's a unique element to it that is, that is, again, unique to the pipeline. So we hire experienced pipeline inspectors that do this work all over the country. Um, and the reason we do that is, if we reference back to Dakota Access again, we had, we had work being done, inspection being done for about 14 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, at times for, for months on end. Uh, and when things started to slow down, that meant that we went from seven days a week down to six days a week. Our inspectors bring their campers and, and set them up at campgrounds so that they are close to the, the grade where they're working. Um, that's the expectation for the inspection. So our inspectors are only hired to do inspection for this project. They're not gonna get called off to do uh, a proposal, they're not gonna get called off to do inspection on another project. They're not gonna miss inspection because they were uh, filling in for something else. This is what they're hired to do. On top of that, they're expected to, to be inspecting the specific element of the construction that they were hired to do. So if that's topsoil stripping, they're not gonna get called off to go do grain tile inspection. Uh, the reason we find that's important is because as all of this work is done subsurface, if you don't get eyes on it at the time, you're not gonna know what's there. And your landowners are, have put in a lot of time, a lot of money into their fields. Uh, if in three, four, five years from now, they're having issues with drain tile that they never had before, it's these inspection reports that's just gonna help them um, come to some solution with the pipeline. So we take it very seriously. Um, we make sure we hire people that understand how these projects work and have the dedication to be out there for the duration of you said there are 32 counties impacted. You are you already getting letters of intent from 
We have letters of intent from six of them to date, uh, and the IUB, the Iowa Utilities Board, approved this schedule that I, I passed on about 10 days ago, and I'm, I'm assuming that there is going to be a lot more counties that sign up now. I'm on the Board of Supervisors meetings for like 17 more counties in the next three weeks. Those meetings were set up before the utility board approval, but now there's, there's a, a specific time frame that they need to make a decision if they want an inspector at that. Um, so I'm guessing that that number will go up. Um, yeah, I'd just comment that I, there's two main things uh, that are important in my mind is one for the consultant to have experience in pipeline inspection and ISG did gain a lot of that with the last one. And there's not a lot of firms like he mentioned that do this work. Um, so I, I'm comfortable with their experience they gained from the DAPL pipeline. <clears throat> And there's also some benefit to having continuity between counties. And that's what kind of happened last time as well. We all kind of lined up and used ISG so that they could just jump over the county boundaries without having to worry about it. Um, that was beneficial as well. Um, there's two other things I'd comment. All we've received so far at this point is a letter from uh, Midwest Carbon Express Pipeline and there's two pipelines on the agenda, the Heartland Greenway. We haven't heard about public meetings, anything for that at this point. Um, so if the board did move forward, you'd have to decide if you do both or just the one that we've received a letter on at this point. Um, my question for Evan is, if the board approves the letter of intent, is that enough for you to attend the public meetings? I, I do see benefit in attending that public meeting. Um, and then you come back later and we sign an official contract then? Yes, yeah, like I said, the, the letter of intent is just trying to help us understand staffing, but it also it also ties us to you guys to, to start to do whatever we can for Story County. So yes, we would be at that meeting just based off of the letter of intent. And your time with the any time associated with like attending meetings or whatever again goes built back to the pipeline is that correct 100 percent of everything associated with this project gets built back to the pipeline it, I, I we can put it in whatever you need whatever form story county will never be responsible for a penny on this project i guess i'm, I'm kind of confused about are we not required to do an rfp for even so you might be paid by the pipeline. It's since it's coming through, we're hiring. We would be hiring whoever yep. the inspector is. Go off. Are we not required to issue an RFP for that? I guess we'd have to, we'd have to talk to Ethan about that. Probably, I do not recall doing one for the Dapple pipeline. Um, I don't think they're required for engineering and inspection services by Iowa law, um, but we'd probably double check with Ethan on that. I can address that somewhat just because it's a question that's come up previously is that design services generally are not required by RFP. Um, construction services are, but design services aren't. Um, also, I, I'm not entirely certain how you would RFP this because there's so much variability to how people come at the project, um, number of inspectors, duration of inspectors, it, it, you'd be just shooting in the dark at this point. Uh, and county attorneys from other counties have determined that it has not been necessary. Take that for whatever it's worth. I'm not an attorney by any means, but that's my experience with it has, has come to that conclusion. Other questions? Any additional comments, Darren, that you may have? I just point out for the board's sake, this is simply to protect the private property owners' rights for their land restoration. The county will be involved with 
this appears to go through multiple drainage districts. We'll have to get permits with them. And then road crossings, that's all still handled by the county. But this service is just to private property protection. Just Midwest Carbon. If we don't have Can I get just a touch of an update on that as well? Sorry, just to this sure. they're two entirely different projects, uh -huh. two entirely different contractors are actually going in opposite directions within the state. One's going to North Dakota, one's going to Illinois. There is nothing official yet on the Heartland project. So Darren's absolutely right. They haven't seen anything. They're they're further behind in their scheduling um, than Midwest, so there's no affiliation. If you feel comfortable with just the idea of using the inspection staff the same, um, again, it, it's no it's no cost to you. If you want to hold off on that, we can wait until you have something official that it it's a, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I was just trying to knock out two birds with one stone while sure. here, but it doesn't it doesn't matter one bit. Sure, sure. No, it's, it's, this is more about me making sure that I was making the appropriate motion. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Right, and I did double check just for the uh, like the Midwest carbon. Uh, the meeting is September 13th. September 13th. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. I double I double checked the, the email that came through. Perfect. All right. Thank you. I just want to say that for folks that may be listening, okay. that they that they heard that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I would move approval of signing a letter of intent um, for inspection services for the proposed Heartland Greenway system pipeline and the Midwest Carbon Express pipeline projects with ISG. Second. Any further discussion? Hazel? Aye. Hedden? Aye. Motion approved. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank Darren for your comments as well. Darren, can you just scan that in and send me the document when you get it? Because I think he has to sign it as well. It's a yeah. long so I appreciate it. Thank sure. you. Yep. All right. Next to move on, we've got the conservation quarterly report. And I see Mike Cox here. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. I don't have a lot to add to what's in, in writing, so I'll keep your, your time here brief. Um, we have been this summer uh, exceptionally pleased to be able to uh, have now a new and first watershed coordinator for Story County. Um, so we're just we're really pleased to have Sarah Carmichael on board. Um, I hope some of you I hope you've had a chance to meet her. Um, Sarah comes to us from uh, Iowa Rivers Revival, where she was the executive director there. Part of that, she uh, worked for Iowa Department of Public Health for some time. So appreciate her for being here, and uh, boy, she's just really taken the bull by the horns, showing a lot of initiative and uh, really getting in. And, going to work on some projects so it's a pleasure to have her with us on um, many levels so uh, and again her office is in this building so part of that is is intentional with uh, access to to the board access to other department heads and elected officials in this building so uh, please uh, feel free to knock on her door and call her when you have questions um, in addition, I guess you were, you know, the, the report summarizes a lot of what we've been doing. Um, I'm going to uh, really leave that as stands and, and bring up the item that, that I have at the bottom of the report, and that is the um, Iowa Association of County Conservation Boards annual conference that's coming up here um, just in a matter of weeks now uh, in uh, mid September. So. Um, we're just fortunate to be able to host that. We were on the schedule for last year. Of course, COVID made different plans. And uh, so now we're, we're back at it this year. 
uh, we do have COVID mitigation um, plans uh, in, uh, in the queue for the conference. And so we'll be utilizing those. They'll have to do with everything from um, transportation, uh, face coverings. Uh, face coverings are going to be required at the conference. Uh, and uh, food uh, and beverage services um, all have COVID implications with them, I should say. Uh, mitigation strategies. So um, as of right now, I think we're probably about 230 people um, that will be in attendance. So if you are available to pop in for a little bit during that conference, that would be great. Um, I'll send you the uh, full program brochure once we have that finalized, uh, which I expect here in a couple of days we'll have the final version of that ready. So. With that, I guess I would just take any questions you may have. I can't remember. Have, have you hosted the conference before? Is this a first? We have hosted it before, and I, I hesitate to try to quote a year, but it was in the 90s. Okay. Um, I want to say early 90s or mid 90s, the last time we hosted it. And you were supposed to hold, hold this last year, and it got Correct. rescheduled to Correct. this year. Yes. Um, and we're very, very thankful for uh, last year when we rescheduled it. Of course, the, the association has um, several years of, of uh, conferences lined up in the queue. Mm -hmm. And so last year when we had to make the decision that we couldn't hold the conference, all of those years um, agreed to be bumped one year so that we could hold it this year. So Dubuque County is up next. They'll be in 22 and, and they were gracious enough to move theirs back so that we could still host one year. Appreciative for all those other counties. Yeah. Right. I don't have any other, I mean, that was going to be the area that I had my questions on. So you yeah. answered my questions already. Um, you know, I just think there's, there's something great um, things that have been going on in the county. I appreciate all the work that you and your staff have been doing. Yeah, I, I, it's great the um, increased use of the Heart of Iowa Trail um, and the access clearance later. Are you noticing um, any type of extra upkeep expenses with the additional use of the trails? I mean, is that going okay? I would say right now the answer is we really haven't haven't seen a lot of added maintenance expenses on it. Um, we are getting significant more use. We do have trail counters out and so we're get, starting to get some of those uh, count, counts coming back and so we're starting to be able to quantify that the uh, usages. Um, that will show, continue to show, uh, be important as we move forward for more grant um, applications on future paving work. Um, we, uh, we do have some grants moving forward. Um, However, we, we did not get probably the largest grant that we, that we requested to do the next phase. Um, but, uh, but we do have some moving forward and, you know, we'll continue the efforts. I know Collins is very interested, Maxwell is very interested, and, and so we'll continue to uh, turn rocks over to try to find available grant funds for that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The opening celebration was wonderful. It was, it was a, yeah. that was a really fun time. Um, oh, good. At Colo. Yeah, in Colo. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. We hope to be able to, to uh, continue to do that. No plans have been formalized for next year, but uh, we hope to be able to continue to co host, if you will, the Colo Crossroads event at Hickory Grove Park. Well, it, it was, like I think, a good time was had by all. Yeah. I mean, there's a good turnout of people. Yeah. There for that. The weather was nice. So. Yes, absolutely. It was a gorgeous day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we made it the rain drops. Educational experience. Their, uh, uh, opportunities are are flourishing too. I'm glad to see the the work being done at the schools and. And that's um, as you well know. Um, that's uh, takes a lot of coordination right now with with all of the COVID procedures and, and um, so our staff has been uh, very busy now scheduled meeting with all of the uh, elementary schools and, and some others as well uh, and uh, getting the essentially getting the full school year calendared out right now 
and so we're we've been very busy with that. That's great. I appreciate all the work you guys do. All here. Very good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay. We don't have any other reports, um, upcoming agenda items. The only thing I can say would be the one that got moved today that will be uh, done at a later date. Um, with that, I'll open it up. Public forum number two. Comments from the public on items not on this agenda. The board may not take any action on the comments due to the requirements of open meetings law, but may do so in the future. If anyone would like to make public comment, if you're on Zoom, you can either use the raise hand function or star nine to unmute yourself. And I'll wait a few seconds because I know that sometimes technology is a little slow and it doesn't always allow you to do what you want to do. And I am not seeing anyone raising their hand or unmuting, so I will close public forum number two. Uh, liaison assignments can be meeting updates from supervisors. Um, I can just say that I will be attending the ISAC conference for the next three days. Um, and then on Monday, for example, I have, or Monday, I have, next Monday, I have um, Micah uh, board meeting. I will also be at the conference the next three days. Um, and then Saturday morning, um, I will be at the overdose awareness event. Um, and then it looks like Tuesday morning, we have our animal control department recognition. Great. Right. All right, and if there is nothing else, to adjourn. And I'll second. Faithful, aye. Head of aye, we are adjourned. Thank you.